Hello everybody, it's Internet Famous Joe Martin, and today I'm going to be talking about Netrunner, Android Netrunner, also known as Nisei. It's one of my favorite um, collectible card games. Actually, uh, it's a living card game, which is a different mutation of the collectible card game format. It's asymmetrical, and it's got a lot to it, and it's really cool. If you like the theme of cyberpunk-themed games, uh, if you like the theme of trickery and intrigue and faking somebody out, it's got that. And it's got a hell of a lot of neat components, so I'm going to go ahead and try and teach it here. So, what I've got in front of me here, this is the Tabletop Simulator variant. Um, it's a module of Netrunner. And to give you an idea, this mat and everything, none of this vis visual stuff, you're going to get a couple of decks of cards some different counters and things like that with your box. If you're playing Nisei, you're pretty much going to get the cards and you're going to have to supply your own counters and things like that, which is fine. Dice and everything works just fine. So I'm just going to show you the basics of this. So there's two sides of play. Like I said, it's asymmetrical. So you have this side, which is going to be the side I teach first, which is corporate. And then you have the other side. Let me do that again, uh, which is going to be the runner. And the runner and the corporation both have different goals to play. In this game, you're going to build decks for both. Because what happens is you complete a game, and then the gameplay shifts to the other side with the other side playing the other group that they didn't play. So you will always play corporation, you will always play runner. You can make the determination on who plays for what first. Um, but in a game, a standard uh, showing of this you're going to basically play one side and then the other side and whoever wins is the winner so um but let's talk about that let's talk about what we have to do to win actually let's kind of talk about the game state here just to talk about this uh netrunner the decks of cards are determined by your identity every group has a different identity this is a corporate identity called jinteki it has a subgroup called Personal Evolution. Um, I'm going to go ahead and blow this up so you can see it a little bit better. Uh, just to get an idea, and it'll tell you your identity is a megacorp, and every megacorp ID has a unique thing. For instance, where it says wherever an agenda is scored or stolen, you do one net damage. We'll explain what that is. And then in the corner, you have what is the maximum deck size and the out-of-faction uh, points that you can use. You can use any card... Um, outside of this faction but each card has like a number like a basically out of faction rank called influence and you can only have a certain number of those in your deck um yeah so that's essentially the basics of how that works you can only have one id every runner is going to have an id and every corporation is going to have an id and that's going to determine the function of this um the the standard builds of your decks uh, in Netrunner, because you're playing a living card game, when you get the core, you're going to receive uh, basically a build for every deck or every uh, identity that's available. For instance, there are four corporate identities available. There's Haas, Bioroid, Genteki, Wayland Consortium, and NBN, which is the news. Um, and also there's a couple of generic cards, which are just non-faction specific, and they're, they're gray, and they can be included in any deck. Runners are pretty much the same thing, except they only have three. They have the Anarch cards, which are orange. Uh, they have the Criminal Faction and the Shaper Faction, which is green. We'll get into those in a second when we talk about this. So, uh, you'll always have this, and it will always be displayed face up in what is called your headquarters. This just represents who you are and what you do. It needs to be placed on the board next to your deck of cards. Your deck of cards is called R&D. This is where you're starting to fetch all of your assets that you're going to begin to play. And then there's the archives, which is basically your trash, but we'll talk about that in a second. So, we have all of this. You'll see that there's this remote server thing in play, which is where additional cards get played, and you have your spaces for ice. Um, all of that seems confusing, but let's explain what it is. You have your starting credits, which is at five, and in your turn, you have a number of actions that you can do. You'll see these clicks are available here. Now, as you spend a click, you complete actions from this list of actions here. Once you've completed all three, the turn is done, and you pass it to the other player. Uh, for instance, just to get an idea, like our starting game state is that I can draw 
five cards. No, well, let me do five. And I'll show what these are in a second. So you start off, everybody starts their gameplay with five cards. And you can begin your turn. Now, looking at our corp reactions, as you can see, I can spend a time unit to do anything. Um, you don't natively draw in this game unless you have a card in play that lets you do it, and you don't natively gain money unless you do this. So during your turn, I can spend one click to gain a credit, or I can spend one click to draw a card. Or I can spend one click to not do that. I can spend one click to play a card. Uh, what this means is I can place a card anywhere. Now that means I can spend a piece of ice, an asset, an upgrade, or an agenda. These are a lot of types of cards, so let's explain what these are. This card here, which will be played face down, will go into what's called a remote server. And the remote servers are always going to play to the left of headquarters. These are essentially new rows that can be interfaced and uh, affected. The, the goal of the corporation is to accomplish new ventures, new business ventures, things like that, and spend the money to activate this. We're going to pretend that this is face down. Um, looking at this card, we can see that this is an agenda. When you score it, if no corporation cards have been added to archives this turn, you can reveal one face down agenda and archives to score in your area. So it does something when you complete it. The cost in the upper right is the cost of money or, or credits that need to go onto this card before you can activate it. The little one with the bolts is the scoring value. In this game, you want to score seven or more agenda points to win the game. Corporations can only do this by spending time and money to put those on here. Let's pretend, for instance, let's say I didn't draw this one, and we're going to put it back. We're actually going to restart the whole turn, just to show. So, my first click, I'm spending a time unit to play this card here. Okay? So, that's great. I know it's there. I could also spend two clicks and two money to put two credits on here. Let me find some credits here and put them on here. Just to show that these are being what is called advanced. Once I have three credits on here, this card flips, it's scored, the effect goes into play, and then it is placed into a scoring area for being scored. Again, when I get seven of these, uh, it's pretty good. So let's clear this out. And it would be scored. You cannot score an agenda pretty much on the same turn as you play it. Now, other things that you can place there are assets, which I don't believe I have any in hand. I do not. Um, upgrades, which will go below in the root of the server. Uh, all of these cards will be placed face down. Pretty much every card the corporation is playing is going to be face down because this is all a mind game. It's all a deception game. Uh, some of the assets and things that you can play could be traps. They could be things to harm the other player. Uh, in fact, you want to play that way because otherwise you want the player to be scared to interfere with your business. Um, you can also place what is called a piece of ice. Now, what ICE is, is it's called an intrusion countermeasure, or ICE is the nickname. Um, and what this is, is something that you can play, again, face down, in front of a server. And what this represents is a barrier that the runner will encounter uh, when making a run on your server. What that means is, if I get my arrow, if a player decides to make a run on this server to try and attack it, he has to bypass potentially every piece of ice that blocks it or restricts it. So if you have no ice in front of it, the runner's going to get right in, he's going to access it. If a runner accesses this, he scores it. He doesn't get the ability, but it goes into the scoring zone. They also have to get seven or more to win. 
Um, gameplay stops at 7, but they can get 7 or 8 or potentially 9. Um, these pieces here are things that you put in place as the corporation to stop the runner from getting in. These pieces have their own costs. Let me show you this card here. Um, they face sideways. Um, you'll see that it has the top left corner. It is the what is called a res cost. That is the number of money that you have to have available in your pile to flip the card over and cause it to do its thing. Um, you'll see that it costs three. I have three credits here, so it would cost me three to spend it. Uh, the ice type tells you what type of um, wall it is. It could be a sentry, it could be a code gate, or it could be a uh, barrier. I believe there's three types. Um, and it'll tell you that's the type of, you know, ice it is. The runner is going to have to have what is called a code breaker to get through it. And the code breaker they have will only interfe interface with this. So if a, code if a runner has a code breaker, ice breaker, it can't be used to stop this effect. When a runner encounters it, it does whatever it says on the top. So says, when you read this ice during a run against the server, I can trash one card from my headquarters, which is your hand, to do two net damage. Net damage is a type of damage that you will do to a player. There is what is called net damage. There is what is called meat, uh, yeah, net damage, meat damage, and brain damage. There's three types of damages. Net damage and meat damage are effectively the same thing. Anytime a player, uh, a runner gets damaged, they lose one card. If something causes two net damage, they drop two cards from their hand. If there's ever any point where the runner is reduced to negative one cards, they are dead. You flatline them. They are basically dead and they won't interact. I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll be dead and the corporation wins. Um, Meat damage typically doesn't happen from doing a run. Net, net damage is the only thing that really happens from doing a run and it going bad. Um, there's also brain damage, which brain damage is a more serious form of kind of both. Because what happens is when brain damage is inflicted, that player's maximum hand size decreases. So if I do one point of brain damage to a runner, their maximum of five drops to a max of four, and you know so on and so forth down the line. Um, Every ice has what is called a subroutine, which is the little arrow where it says do one net damage. If the player cannot, if they run into this ice and they don't have a code breaker to stop it or an icebreaker to stop the effects on here, it goes through the list and does everything that it says. This um, ice is interesting because it'll do two net damage if I, if I spend, if I trash a card to do it. And then it'll do another net damage. So it does three net damage. It doesn't end the run. A lot of ice has a subroutine that says end the run, which tells the player you're booted off the server and you go back and you do not accomplish the goal. If you don't have the ice or if you don't have the credits to pay for it, this stays flipped. Um, also, if you have, let's say, for example, as you're playing, you can have as many rows of ice as you want. The thing is, is for each additional piece to place, it costs, the first one is free. The second one is here, but it also costs a credit to play it. And then this one will cost two additional credits to play it and so on and so forth. So when you res it, you're gonna, it's gonna affect your stockpile of cash. Um, other things that you can do, uh, let's see. These are important because these pieces of ice need to be placed all over the corporation side. If you, let's use an example here just to show. I've obviously copied and cheated because I'm using a fake card, but um, the state of play is gonna look a lot like this. This card will never be shown. If you're putting money on it to advance it, then obviously something's going on with it. It could be, it's most likely an agenda, but it could be a trap, and you're going to run into that face first. Jinteki is a corporation that uses a lot of traps and ambushes to spend money on things that look like they're enticing targets, and then they'll flip it, and it'll turn out to be something that does a lot of damage and kills a runner dead. Um, but remote servers are pretty much where you put all of your agendas that need to be done. The advantages to running on your headquarters is that if the runner gets in, 
to here, then the player gets to access one of your cards from your hand at random. And at that point, they pick one card. If it is an agenda, they score it. They get a point. They've gotten into your headquarters, they've pulled some files, and they've managed to score one against the evil empire, and they get a point. So you want to have defenses on here. If you make a run on your deck, R&D, and there is no defense, well, here's what happens. You take the top card, you reveal it, it's an agenda, they score it. If it's not an agenda, let's say it's scored. If it's revealed from R&D, they must reveal it. When a runner accesses this card from anywhere except archives, I can pay four credits. That symbol there is for credits. If I do, I give the runner what is called a tag, which is a, basically a location ID that says that the corporation knows where they're at. And they can do a lot of mean stuff with tags. That's typically where meat damage comes from. You can trash cards they have and do three net damage. So this is an example of an ambush. This is that. Um, the trash cards, uh, trash can symbol in the corner will tell you once the runner has accessed it, they can pay that many credits to destroy this card. Um, so yeah, potentially cards like this, like when we're talking about advancing things or putting things here, you could put this face down and have a runner splat into it and then you'll reveal it and then bad things happen if you pay the cost. So if the runner, if I, I couldn't pay it now because I only have three, but if I had four and then I went down to zero and I did this and they had run into this, let's say for example, then that runner would be dealing with six net damage and probably be dead. So good thing to keep in mind. Um, where did that go? That went here. All right. Um, archives is where all of your cards that are spent and trashed will go. Sometimes something can cause you to uh, take a card and place it face down in the archives, which, you know, sometimes that'll happen. Some cards get discarded or removed from play, um, and potentially you may have to move something just to move it. If the runner targets here, they access every card in the archives, which, you know, it's in the trash, and it's probably in the trash for a reason, but if they have any agendas in the trash... They score all of them. So you want to keep your archives defended. There's also a lot of cards that do different effects in the archives. Um, so yeah, that is how that works. I'm going to do some querying here just to do that. I'm going to put all these back. So there's a lot going on here, obviously. Headquarters is your hand, R&D is your deck of cards, Archives is your garbage. You can put a root card, you can put any number of root cards, there's going to be cards called upgrades, that when you see them, they can go here, they go face down, you can pay the cost when the root is accessed, when they access the main deck, if it hasn't been revealed, you can flip it, and usually they'll do some kind of effect. They'll have trash can symbols as well. And the runner, when accessing it, which is actually, it's called interfacing now, can pay the extra cost to get rid of these cards and put it in the archives. Seems like a lot. It is a lot. We haven't gotten to the other side yet, but it's really cool. Um, trust me. Let's take a look here, just to, to go over it again. So, you have three clicks per turn. Once you run out of clicks, it goes to the next person. You can draw a card from R&D you don't get I, I think I think corpse do actually get an auto draw that might be something I have to look into I'm sorry um, you can spend a click to gain a credit you can spend a click to install an agenda here an asset here an upgrade here or a piece of ice which will go over here horizontally over one of your new servers. You can have an infinite number of remote servers. So this thing can go all the way across. And not all of them will necessarily have one, but the thing is that you're trying to make an enticing target for the runner to splat into. Um, you can do uh, all three of your clicks to do something called purge virus counters, 
Runners can do things to where they can virus some of your cards, particularly your security, your, um, your ice cards, which can make life a living hell. But if you spend an entire turn wasting it, you will clear all virus counters from the board, and that's on their side or yours. So, um, or you can pay one click and two money to trash a resource if the runner is tagged. What that means is on the other side of play, anything that's been placed in the resource row, these are helpful things to get the runner more money, more access to things. If they're tagged, if they have tags, you can pay two credits and a click to get rid of one of their cards, which could be really beneficial. And that is it. So once that's clear, you can potentially get cards to increase your number of clicks. That's usually from agendas, but sometimes it'll happen. And yeah, that is effectively what happens. Also, when you score an agenda or something is stolen, you deal one net damage, period. So that is the ability of this ID. Every ID has something different. So that's a lot, um, understandably a lot, but I'm going to actually load up the other side of this to show you how runners work. So... Obviously a lot going on here. We're gonna take a look at the ID card. This is what is called a shaper card. You can recognize it from the symbol in the top right and that it's green. Um, it has a number which is called link. Link is for contested, um, uh, there's certain situations that contest. They don't come up too often, but it's a good thing to have. It's essentially, it's an invisible amount of money that you can use for your side to win a conflict. Um, there is a memory cost below that in this little memory slot called where it says four. It's also on here. And what that is, is that is the maximum number of memory that you can install in your program row. Um, things can potentially increase that if you have cards for it. Typically your code breakers and things that you install, your things to hack into the system will cost a certain number of RAM or, or memory. So you can't go over that. So once you have all of that out, you want to check your memory costs of your cards. There are hardware, which is essentially consoles, uh, chips, cyber tech, things like that. They're going to make your job easier. Your resources, which I was kind of describing earlier, um, are assets like, you know, a guy or you've got a contact with somebody or you've got access to bank accounts or things like this, where your money will kind of pool and do things like this. There's a lot of things that can be in this resource row. Uh, the stack, this is in the wrong spot. The stack is what these, the deck of cards for a runner. The heap is their um, garbage pile. And the console is something that they may have in their deck. Uh, they can only have one in a deck that will be a computer that they can use to access this stuff. You already have a computer. You don't need a console to do a, a run. Um, it's just something that's going to make your life easier if you have it. Um, same as before, but the thing is, is that you draw one card for stack for your uh, for a click. You can gain one uh, credit for a click. You can install a program, a piece of hardware or resource, which we went over. You can spend a click to pay, play an event. An event also has a cash cost usually. So it's do this, pay the credits, and you can do the thing. You can pay a time click and uh, two credits to remove a tag if a runner has um, got any tags on them from a corporation. They do stack, and there's no limit to the number you can have. They're never good to have because they basically say, they know where you are and they can potentially do a lot of things to mess up your day or you can spend one click to make a run. What that means is you're initiating an attack on the corporate side to do something. You're trying to get their money. You're trying to get the piggy bank and score some points. Um, same as before, I'm actually going to switch sides to this officially so we can draw five new cards. And I'm going to draw five just to show you an idea of what we've got so from from memory and i do apologize corporations do get one free draw every turn that kind of is factored into their cost that's why they have three runners have four but they ought they don't get an automatic draw 
um, you have to willingly draw a card to do this. Uh, you to you have to willingly spend the credit to draw additional cards. Now, there's no limit to the number of actions you can do. If you wanted to spend all four of these, you can draw four cards, or you can draw. Um, you could draw four cards. You do have to discard down to five. I do know that you have a max hand size of five, which I haven't gone over. But let's say, for instance, you got all these cards. You got some cool stuff. Sure Gamble's a great card, because this is going to show you how an event works. Um, you start off with five credits. This event costs five. And it's an event. It costs one click to play it. On the first turn, basically I'm spending all of these in effect to play it. It goes into play, wherever, and it does the thing. It tells you, you gain nine. So you are spending five to gain nine. Means you have more money. Pretty neat. Um, there's other things that you can do, which is um, you could spend a click to install a program. You'll see that in the top left, you've got the credit cost, which is zero, the memory cost, which is one, and then the uh, the information about what it does. There's a strength factor in the lower right, which um, comes into terms when you do a run um, to break into an ice. It's uh, ice is going to have a specific strength. This one's a little bit different. It works differently, but um, this one doesn't have a strength factor because it's not really in a thing to interface with. It does have this symbol with the, the credits with the uh, the diamond. But it's got a number on it, or it's got an arrow over it that says two, or an arrow and the, the number two, which means it's getting what's called um, hosted credits, which are also recurring credits. So when you install it, you refill it, you put two hosted credits on it. And at the start of your turn, every time it gets two credits on it, meaning that it tells you you can use these credits to pay trash costs of assets. So you could spend those to trash other cards that aren't agendas. If you pull something and it's like a resource or something that the corporations can use and it's got a trash can and it's got two on it, well then guess what? You can spend these two credits on it to trash it for free. That's all right. You know, it's not, I mean, it's, it's good. There's, there's situations for it. Um, the thing with Netrunner is that you're planning against uncertainty and you're packing you're trying to make a perfect blend of stuff you won't have a perfect blend of things for every deck but you will try and you're going to face plant a lot which um you're going to make runs that you aren't equipped to handle and you're going to have to figure out ways to do it um we're going to pretend i didn't play that because i didn't play it okay but let's say i played another card like this this is a resource card no this is a hardware card and this is a prepaid voice pad. It's got two credit costs in the top left-hand corner. You'll see that it's got that same one in the recurring credit, which means that I can fill it. Before your turn begins, it gets one hosted credit, and you can spend those to play events. So that's pretty handy. You can take this, and if you have an event that costs something, like um, like if we played this uh, Sure Gamble, I would spend four from the pot, and I would spend one here, to pay the five cost and then I would gain nine. So, and then at the beginning of my next turn, the credit fills back up. So pretty cool. Um, let's see, resources, okay. So I can spend a click and a credit to play a resource. And it'll tell you it's a resource again. The cost of it is in the top left. Um, it costs one. When you install this resource, you load nine credits onto it. When it's empty, you trash it. Um, and then it's got a thing where it makes a new ability saying, if you spend a click, you can take three, cre uh, three credits from this resource, use it only once per turn. So this is cool. Cause you can place nine of these on here. There are fives. Um, if you want to have less tokens it doesn't really matter however you want to do it but so in my turn now that i've installed this i can spend one click it tells you can only do it once per turn and you can get these three credits and they go over here 
pretty cool. Um, again, if there's no credits on it, then after it's all said and done, it gets trashed and it goes in the heap. Uh, what else can I do? What else can I do to show you? Let's say I can spend another point to install another program. And this is a virus. So this is um, a program that says when you make a successful run on a central server. And what that means is that is the headquarters, that is the R&D, that is the archives. It is never a remote server. Uh, remote servers are something different. Central servers are always those three because they're always going to be in play. So anytime you do a successful run on a central server, you can place one virus counter on this program. And I got one right here. Boop. And you can spend one of those saying that the ice you're encountering gets minus one strength for the remainder of this encounter. So what this does is it makes these security protocols easier to get into um, by weakening their strength and making them more suspect to beat this stuff. I don't have any code breakers in hand yet, so I can't really show you how that works, but we're going to cheat in a second. I'll show you how that works. I'm going to show you a hypothetical because the last thing I can do with my last click is make a run. When I make a run, I can choose to target the archives, the R&D, the headquarters, or any of these other remote servers out. Um, ICE will be put into play. So I'm going to say, let's just say this is for some reason because the corporation always goes first. And the corporation will always have a piece of ICE out. The first run will probably have something exposed and you can target it. So uh, let's say I target the R&D. There's no ICE right now, so I'm not running into anything. So the runner makes a successful run. And that means that this thing here has completed a successful run. It gets a virus counter, which stays on it. And I get to look at the top card only, maybe, if I can click on it. And it's revealed to the runner. The corporation doesn't see it. The only time they see it is if it is um, an asset that says ambush or if it is an agenda. If it's an agenda, the player can take it. This is obviously a piece of ice. Um, the player can't interact with it because there's nothing he can do. He can't pay any cost to trash it. It's revealed. You do a symbol. Nope, that's not good. It goes right back on top. If I did a run on the headquarters, I could look at any one of his five cards or however many cards he has in his hand. Pick it. Look at it. If it's something I can score, I can score it. If it's something I can trash, I can pay the cost to trash it. Otherwise, it goes back in his hand. If I access archives, I can look at every card in the archives. If there's any agendas in there, I can score them. Um, if there's any ambushes, but I don't think ambushes work in the archives, so there's no risk there. Some some cards do, but um, there's a lot of cards in this game. Uh, and if there's a remote server, like I would can and I get through, I access the card, and if it's good and it's an agenda, I can take it. If it's an asset, I can get screwed by it and probably die. We'll see what happens. So right now, let's say, let's use a hypothetical here. Let's say we had that card here. This gets rezzed. Let's say, all right, I spend my last click and I do a run. I decide I'm feeling frisky and I'm going to hit R&D. The run begins here at this outer point. I can't access R&D. Like basically I'm moving forward incrementally piece by piece to do this. Let's say I'm feeling really, really, really frisky and I decide to attack R&D knowing that it's well fortified. Don't know why I would do that, but I just decided to do it. The corporation looks and says, do I want to pay the cost to res this card? And the corporation says, no. Great. I advance to this point. I can then choose to end the run. I can say, cool, I'm going to pull the plug and jack out, and I'm going to not be doing this anymore because this is a bad idea. Or I can choose to say, hell with it, keep going. Looking at what the, the credits are for the corporation is going to be an important thing because you'll know if somebody has the money to res something. Typically, ICE is expensive to do that. If you see that the corporation has bungled it up and has zero credits, there's a good chance you're going to get in here. If they've got three or four of them, there's a chance. Let's do a hypothetical because I know what this costs. 
So I get to this next point. Do they want to res this heist? Nope. I go here. Do I want to jack out? No. Okay, cool. Next phase to finish this. Does the corporation player want to pay the cost to res this ice? They do. Cost eight. It has a strength of five. And it's got some text on it. So all this money goes away immediately because they paid it. This card stays unavailable, so now the runner knows what's here. When you have an encounter with Anansi, or whenever an encounter with Anansi ends, do three net damage unless the runner broke all subroutines on it. It is a sentry. I don't have a code breaker to do anything about it, so it tells me what I can do as the corporation. I can look at the top five cards of R&D, and I can arrange them in any order. So the corporation can look at these top five cards and say, oh, crap, there's an agenda on top here. I want to move it to the bottom of that pile or whatever. Or they can set an ambush up, or they can suit anything. You, you may draw one card. The runner may pay two to also draw one card, and then you do one net damage. Um, so what that means from that point is that the corporation gets a free draw. The runner can pay two credits to draw an additional card for themselves, and then they're going to take one net damage, which means the card in hand is discarded. If this brings me to zero, I'm still in play. If I'm at negative one, I'm dead. If I can't stop, I can't break all of these subroutines with a code breaker, which is what's happening. I take three additional damage, which means my card hand would be to negative three, and I'm brain dead in a chair somewhere, <laughs> uh, basically with my head on fire because I couldn't stop it. So I lose. Corporation wins. Yay. Um, it's that quick. It can happen very quickly. It's a game of risks uh, because it's a lot of reading the table and reading what people can do uh what what is available uh so at this point like i would be dead the game would end people would shake hands yay um if for some reason this wasn't rezzed and i did get all the way through i would look at the top card this has no it's called an operation this is basically what an event is for uh the corporation uh it doesn't have any cost for me to trash it it doesn't have anything for me to interact with i can't do anything it goes back and the run is completed if that run had been successful oh no it is successful because i was able to access it i get a virus counter because of this card um but i don't get anything to steal if there was something different like an agenda haha i take it awesome runner gets one point does not get the ability. Runner only gets the points and they get the, the, the bragging rights of taking a card, but they want to get seven of them. Runner uh, agendas can rank from one to three. Sometimes I think they might be more, um, but typically they're in the one, two, or three rank um, to accomplish that. Oh, and uh, runners also have the same thing. Um, I talked about the max hand size um, in, or the maximum deck size in the lower left-hand corner. Same thing with them. This character, Real Kit Peddler, has uh, 45 maximum cards, and they have a maximum influence of 10, which means out of faction things like if I'm using Anarch cards, or, or which are the orange cards, or criminal cards, which are the blue cards, I can only have 10 points between them all in the deck. This card here is an Anarch card. You can tell because of the orange background. In the lower right, you see this little thing where it's got the one through five uh, slot stacked. That means that there's one point out of faction. So that goes against that 10, meaning I have nine more out of faction points to play. That is the very, very rudimentary <laughs> basics of this game that I haven't played in several years, and I know I'm leaving stuff out. We haven't talked about Link because it doesn't come up in play too often. It's usually when there's some kind of challenges involved by certain cards, but it's not a very common thing, uh, but it will happen. Um, the goal of the runner obviously gets seven points. The goal of corporation gets seven points and all these abilities here. They need to build up your wall. There is a definite early game, mid game, and end game phase where the entire shape of the board changes. The runner starts off weak, the corporation starts off money rich, but we can now this, and they have to build their defenses and then start advancing their goals. The runner is spending that time to build up the optimum 
uh, basically computer to go over here and kick some ass and take all of this uh, this evil evil money from evil evil scheming corporations and that's it this game uh, this module here is the ultimate complete version of Netrunner which includes all of the cards since its 2012 um, launch and the uh, again nonprofit uh, for a continuation of the game under the form of Nisei, which is the same thing, just been rebranded. But um, Nisei is the current way to go and way to play. This game is played very often in tournament structure and is uh, really, there's nothing quite like it because you've got on the table play, you're reading people, you're reading reactions. It's pretty cool. Like, I, I always, always will be a proponent for this game. It was super fun when I played it. Um, it's it's really got a it's a hell of a learning curve to get into it but once you get it it's super fun there's no game quite like it i love the strategy of it and um it's got about 2000 cards um got resources to net deck through netrunnerdb.com which uh gives you plenty of stuff to start off with there are starting decks for introductory things if you're playing nisei or even online there's lots of just starting decks to get your feet wet to say cool let's learn basic concepts and do this and then you can go and do advanced deck building from there um so there that's that's the video that i kind of wanted to make i roughly talked about all of it it's not going to be chapter broken because this is very off the cuff, but I wanted to film something talking about Netrunner because it's pretty cool. And I definitely want to play more of it on Tabletop Simulator. If you don't have it, I always will be an advocate for it as well for having unlimited resources to pretty much every board game that's ever been made. And, you know, you know, for a $20 intro cost for the program, again, I'm not sponsored by these guys. I just love talking about it. It's often on sale for 10 get in on it and you can play magic you can play netrunner you can play go you can play trouble you can play whatever you want play connect four but you can play netrunner and you should play netrunner with me so that's how you play and i'm gonna go ahead and stop it here because i'm gonna stop it here so thanks for listening see you on the on the flip side you dirty dog <laughs>